Hello and thank you for joining this session. My name is Asaf Morag and I lead the Threat Intelligence Collection and uh, Security Data Analysis with uh, Team Nautilus at Aqua Security. Uh, Aqua Security is the largest pure play cloud native security company uh, providing customers the freedom to innovate and accelerate their digital transformations. Uh, Team Nautilus focuses on cybersecurity research and cloud native stack. We basically, our mission is to uncover new vulnerabilities, threats, uh, cyber attacks against the containers, Kubernetes, and other cloud infrastructure. And we're basically responsible uh, to learn and understand the threat landscape, uh, the adversaries, who they are, what are the goals, what are the, what are the techniques that they are using, um, I am responsible uh, to do the preliminary processing of all the cyber attacks. Uh, that means that I see 100% of the attacks and some of them I analyze myself, some of them I pass to other team members. And today I wish to speak with you about the digital transformation that we see in uh, cloud and cloud native and some of the attacks that we've seen over the past few years and how do they affect the bigger picture which is the threat landscape. Thank you. In this talk I will explain about the digital transformation to the cloud, uh, what is cloud native, what are containers, what is Kubernetes, uh, but I won't go too much into details uh, although some of you uh, might not be too familiar with these topics I believe that most of you have heard about these topics and are aware of the, some of the details. Uh, then I will dive into details and speak about the techniques that we see in campaigns that target cloud native uh, environments in the wild. And finally, I will speak about the threat landscape and what the digital leaders uh, need to do in order to protect uh, their organizations. Well, ear-to-ear -ear, uh, digital transformation to the cloud hasn't slowed down uh, during COVID-19. One can even claim that uh, uh, COVID-19 accelerated the move to the cloud and cloud native technology. Uh, as many business uh, opened the uh, online channels uh, due to COVID-19, uh, let's say if I had a small family business and um, many people didn't come to the store, to the physical store, uh, so it was empty during lockdown and people were afraid to get out of their homes. Uh, so in many parts of the world, uh, these small businesses started to open online uh, shops and you can see an increase in the online and e-commerce traffic uh, during uh, this period. Let's say that I wish to build uh, an online application uh, for my toy store. Uh, for many years, and even today, uh, developers used to work in a monolithic uh, architecture, and they build uh, their application uh, as a single project um, with one big team. Everyone shared the same uh, code base, and updates, new features, and changes were tedious and painful, uh, a single bug could have affected the entire uh, deployment and the delivery process. Then microservices architecture became popular. You build one or many processes per each business logic function that you have. Uh, these microservices communicate over uh, HTTP protocol via API, and the development is continuous, uh, with small teams of between six to eight uh, developers, uh, each working on one or two specific problems or uh, business logic functions. They use different code bases, maybe even different uh, code language. And if they build it right, the application won't crash over a single bug. So utilizing the benefits of cloud native infrastructure, uh, organizations can save a lot of money and they only pay for the infrastructure uh, resources that they use. But wait, what's uh, cloud native? So the term cloud native refers to the concept of building and running applications to take the advantages of distributed computing. Uh, cloud services providers offer today tools and services that allow developers to reduce operational and cost 
build and the developers can build their application faster. Uh, so you can see on the top left of cloud native uh, image uh, the term CICD. CICD stands for uh, Continuous Inter Integration and Delivery or Deployment and DevOps uh, stands for co the Correspondence uh, and Practices between Developers and Operations to deploy the software. Now let's talk about containers. Container is a standard unit of software that packages up code and all its dependencies. You can build your container on one host and easily run it on another host with container technology. Hence, you can share containers with others, you can move them to production, and they will reliably run on other computing, envi computing environments without the overhead of worrying about code dependencies and the infrastructure. Container technology is not a new concept, they exist since the 80s, but they became real popular, really popular when Docker released their container product in 2013. But a single application is built on many microservices that run different containers. A peak in traffic may force you to launch more containers for the same microservice, or you may suffer from a container failure. So basically you need something to orchestrate all these containers and to make sure that they still run. And for that you need an orchestration software uh, that makes the application, uh, that enable the application run smoothly. Kubernetes is a popular container orchestration software and it runs on several different hosts or nodes uh, when one node is the master, it is responsible to orchestrate everything and the rest of the nodes um, contain one or more containers. As cloud technologies become cheaper, easier to use and more available, they are adopted widely by organizations across the world. The demand for highly experienced and proficient practitioners makes it harder to occupy these positions. On top of that, abundant supply of products and frequent changes in imp and improvements makes it harder for practitioners to gain experience with these technologies and that may lead to mistakes such as misconfigurations. Cloud service providers like Amazon, Google and uh, Microsoft are well aware of that and add mechanisms to protect the end users. But unfortunately, it's not always uh, enough. On the other end of the barricades, attackers never rest. They always try, try finding new ways to exploit these systems and human errors. Now, let's take a deeper dive into the technology of containers. Specifically, I will speak about Docker containers. When talking about Docker containers, there are two Docker objects or concepts that should be explained. Container image is a template that stores the instructions how to create a container, while container is a runnable instance of that container image. You can kind of compare it to the difference between a file and a process. When building or running my application on a specific host, I can use a container image from uh, public or private registries and that way I can build my specific container image or my container. I can use other cloud services such as storage, I can communicate with cloud metadata uh, for the server. In, my, in this specific case, in my application, I am storing uh, one layer of the container image or one layer of the container in a private registry while other layers uh, of the container image in public registry and I am communicating with other services of the cloud service provider and the metadata of the instance. Now let's talk about the attack surface. My application, the Docker software, the underlying host can all have vulnerabilities or misconfigurations and the attackers can exploit them in order to do a lot of damage. They can scan my application for vulnerabilities and exploit them. They can look for misconfigurations in the Docker software, uh, such as Docker daemon that is open to the world and can receive commands from an anonymous user. 
Uh, they can try stealing uh, the, my AWS credentials before or after exploitation, and they can try poisoning a public registry or a public code repository, uh, such as Python, in order to hide malicious code within my application. Naturally, the same vulnerabilities and misconfigurations that apply to containers also apply to containers clusters. When it comes to orchestration, the attack surface is much bigger. I don't want to go uh, too much into details here, uh, so the abstraction of the Kubernetes cluster is very limited, uh, so you can just get the sense of the attack surface. As you can see, Kubernetes has many more APIs, such as the API server for uh, REST operations, and it provides the front end of the cluster uh, for shared states, uh, which also uh, allows all the components to interact with. Or the Kubelet API, which, is, which runs on each and every node, and among other uh, operations, it is responsible to run and uh, stop containers. I have spoken about some of Cloud Native's technology, the attack surface, and now let's talk about attacks against Cloud Native environments in the wild. But before we continue to the attacks in the wild, I wish to speak about cybersecurity terminology. When it comes to cybersecurity researchers and practitioners, uh, we use the MITRE attack framework for taxonomy for both offense and defense. The attack is described by common tactics and techniques to describe adversarial behavior. In the media, you can hear a lot about phishing campaign or a brute force campaign, but these are just two examples that we can find in this framework. In the next few slides, I will use the MITRE technology to describe the techniques that the attackers are using in the wild. In 2018 and 2019, the attacks against containers were pretty simple. Uh, the attacker would have found an initial access, usually a misconfigured Docker API or Docker daemon, runs a dedicated uh, container, uh, specifically he packed in that container an ELF binary, which is a crypto miner, he deploys the crypto miner and executes it, and that's it, that's the attack, very simple, very straightforward. Since then, we've seen uh, a lot of change in the threat landscape, and I'm going to uh, describe some of these techniques right now. One of the categories in MITRE is initial access, and it describes the entry point to the organization or to a host. When it comes to Docker containers, we see a lot of campaigns that target the Docker uh, API or misconfigure the Docker API. At this point, it is crucial to say that we are mainly interested to see what comes next, because attackers will always find their way in and although it is very interesting to understand how Docker daemon misconfigurations behave in the wild, it is not our main target. Having said that, we can see that on average there are 80, 853 compromised hosts per day, with an average of almost 30 new hosts per day, and the average exposure, exposure duration is almost a month. And another interesting uh, thing to know, and this is based on an experiment or a study that we made, uh, in almost 50% of the cases, misconfigured Docker API is attacked within 56 minutes after the misconfiguration, new misconfiguration uh, occurred. Continuing with initial access, when it comes to Kubernetes, there are more APIs and additional services that can be exploited. Using Shodan, which is a static search engine for IPs and the services that run on them, we can mark over 670,000 hosts that run Kubernetes. We cannot uh, exploit most of them, but it's good to know that on these hosts they run Kubernetes. Exploiting misconfigured API server, Kubelet API, and management tools such as Prometheus and C Advisor, one can reveal more about the, the cluster and possibly to um, 
understand the structure of the entire cluster. We're talking about between 1,000 and, uh, and 1,500 hosts that allow you to do that. It is even worse when it comes to etcd, which is a key value database that, is, uh, that resides within the master node, and it can reveal secrets and keys, and we've seen hundreds of keys and secrets uh, that were revealed by a uh, misconfigured etcd. And now for the worst part. A Kubernetes dashboard and other tools such as WebScope or Octant uh, allow complete takeover over the cluster and we've seen hundreds of cases and in the next slide we are going to drill down into that as well. WebScope allow full access to Docker, Kubernetes, distributed cloud operation system and ECS environments. It allows you to gather all the information and metadata about the containers, about the pods, about the namespaces, about the hosts, and allow you to see it in a graph mode or a table. It also allows you to see visual map of Docker runtime environment to connect between cloud uh, workloads. And last but not least, which is the most powerful uh, feature, it allows you to start, stop, open interactive shells with containers, and by that, full control over the cluster. These extensive capabilities also caught the eyes of the attackers, and over the past year, we've seen hundreds of attacks that run scope to gain visibility and control over Kubernetes clusters. With one or two lines of codes, the attackers can gain control over the cluster. In some cases, the attackers may use dedicated containers, uh, container images, or the actual legitimate scope uh, container image, uh, which are stored in Docker Hub. In other cases, the attackers download the software from GitHub, from GitHub or encode the binary in the malicious uh, script, and then launch it with their own service token. Misconfigurations is not the only way to attack containers and orchestration. Using typo squatting, attackers can mislead developers to run from public registries what they think is a popular software. In this case, TensorFlow is a popular framework with data tools, mainly machine learning tools for data scientists. By typo squatting the name of the container image from TensorFlow to TensorFlow, one might be tricked to download this, uh, this misleading container image which contains malicious code with crypto miners and backdoor tools. And there are plenty of other examples from over the past couple of years uh, to such attacks. In this example, attackers exploited GitHub commits to run cryptocurrency. Each commit initiated a CI process that built the container. When the container was built, it ran a crypto, a crypto miner. The attackers opened dozens of malicious accounts under names of popular accounts, in this case of a popular data scientist, probably to mislead GitHub so they won't delete the account. Once the attackers gain initial access, they wish to find the next vulnerable host and to deploy uh, their malicious code. In many campaigns against cloud-native environments, we see cloud worms or highly automated scripts that use powerful scanning tools in order to run malicious container images on the next vulnerable host. Attackers are scanning for misconfigurations. They are looking for a Docker API, Kubelet, API server, Redis, Docker Swarm, and so on. In this figure, you can see that once the worm code finds its vulnerable host, it infects it with, uh, with the two payloads. The first payload is a main payload, usually contains malware, backdoors, and so on, rootkits, and so on, and the secondary payload contains uh, or deploys mascan, and then it uh, communicates with the C2 server in order to get the instructions, the warm configuration, and to understand what it targets, Kubernetes, Docker, and so on. Then it prepares a list of vulnerable hosts and pass it to the worm, which does basically exactly the same. So hence worm, hence highly automated script. 
another trend that we've seen, uh, attackers are using offensive security tools written by uh, security researchers, or sometimes even malicious code uh, written by other uh, hackers, um, in order to attack cloud native environments. So we've seen the use of uh, Cube Hunter, which is uh, Aqua's open source pen testing tool, uh, Pirates, which is another Kubernetes uh, pen testing tool. Uh, these are used in order to uh, scan the environments and to understand what they can exploit in these clusters. Uh, once they gain their access, sometimes they're using a bob or break out of the box in order to escape the container, Dipsy in order to understand, uh, to enumerate uh, Docker uh, containers and other capabilities. Uh, we've seen the use of Punk in order to uh, collect SSH keys and other secrets. Uh, so basically it's a trend that we've seen a lot over the past uh, couple of years. To collect unsecured credentials, uh, attackers are using scripts like the one on the left. Uh, they are trying to query uh, cloud metadata for uh, the specific instance and trying to collect uh, IAM roles, secrets, access uh, uh, keys, and so on and so on. Another example uh, is using the script punk that I mentioned earlier in order to collect uh, keys, secrets, passwords. In this specific example, you can see that the script found uh, three uh, users, root and sysadmin, and also uh, three known hosts, and some uh, SSH keys that are related to that. After collecting this data, the attacker can actually um, do a lateral movement to these hosts and possibly to do some more damage. Attackers are also disabling security tools. In this case, they are downloading scripts that um, disable these security tools like uh, Aliun of uh, Alibaba's cloud, uh, but also uh, remove some of the binaries and stop services the, in order to uh, conceal their attacks so they won't be detected by these tools. Continuing with defense evasion techniques, attackers also deploy more sophisticated tools such as rootkits. A rootkit is a program that provides continued uh, privileged access to a system while actively hiding its presence. In this case, we detected uh, these rootkits, these are two rootkits, in the same attack in a campaign by Team TNT. Team TNT is a very active threat actor that throughout 2019 and 20, 2020 and 2021 have been deploying a, and initiating attacks and campaigns against cloud a, environments such as CACD pipelines, container environments, and Kubernetes clusters. In this specific example, they are trying to run Diamorphin, which is a kernel space rootkit, and if it fails, they try to run another rootkit which attacks in the user space. This rootkit in the user space is trying to actively change PS, PS3, and top applications in order to hide high CPU uh, usage. Continuing with the same campaign by Team TNT, they are trying to run the Nymorphin. In the code here, you can see marked in red a piece of code that is basically encoded in base64. When you decode it, it is a tar file or a compressed file. When you extract the file, you see a C code of the diamorphin and they need to uh, compile it. Uh, basically, they're using three or four types of defense evasion techniques in order to hide the diamorphin. Attackers also use tools like Tsunami Malware. Tsunami Malware is a very powerful uh, malware. It opens IRC communication channels and allows the attacker to gain control from remote, uh, to uh, enter the host uh, through a backdoor, or to run denial of a service attack uh, through the Tsunami Malware. Going back to the first slide in this section, I presented how attacks uh, against containers look like in 2018, 2019. Pretty simple attacks, basically finding initial access, initiating 
uh, container image running it as a container and executing a crypto miner, a very simple and straightforward attack. In 2020 and 2021, we see a very different uh, picture. Basically, the execution of crypto miner is just a low hanging fruit that the attackers are using in order to gain money from the attack, to monetize their attack. But they have other goals, nefarious goals, trying to uh, take over the host, trying to steal credentials, trying to attack other hosts to expand throughout the network, and uh, more and more ways and techniques to hide their attacks. So these days, attacks are much more sophisticated, uh, using many more techniques that basically makes the entire threat landscape um, more complex and organizations should uh, take into consideration these aspects when they are trying to defend their environments. The success and massive adoption of cloud and cloud-native approaches created the perfect storm. First, cloud-native is about componentizing the application. Instead of one monolith that is complex to maintain, a typical cloud application will have many smaller components interacting with one another. This is great innovation and development velocity but it comes with a price of new and wider attack surface. Second, cloud service providers such as Amazon, Microsoft, Google, and others are innovating at cloud speed, which means that new and updated services introduced on weekly basis. Keeping up with security implications of these changes require a dedicated team of experts that continue to learn and to adjust all the time the definitions of best practice uh, for everything when it comes to the cloud and to cloud native. And finally, introducing of shift left, which means that developers have end-to-end -end responsibilities for their applications and components. It also means that the traditional checkpoints and reviews by centralized teams of security experts are not always possible for changes in a continuous de delivery model. All these factors are creating a new situation where new issues are introduced and these teams of uh, security experts, developers, DevOps, they need the right tools and the right way to detect and mitigate these risks. So the responsibility of digital leaders is to provide them with these tools so they will be able to uh, act in this new environment. Thank you. Thank you for listening uh, to my talk about the evolving threat landscape in the cloud and cloud native. For more great sources of knowledge, you can find uh, on our website, uh, in our in uh, blog.aquasec.com or our research team, uh, aquasec.com slash research. And you can follow us in on Twitter, uh, thank you and have a great day.